So let us join together in the call to worship. Oh God, open my lips. And I am not sure of your praise. Praise to the holy and undivided Trinity, one God. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I love God who hears my request for mercy. Our call out to God, God is not a lot of ideas, God listens closely to me. Death's ropes bound me, the distress of the pit found me. I came face to face with my trouble and grief. So I call on your name, God, be your name. What can I give back to God for all the good things God has done for me? I will live out the path of salvation and I'll call on your name. I will praise my promises to God in the presence of all the people. We will sing together all three verses of hymn number 243, Alleluia, Alleluia, Hearts to Heaven. Uh, well, there's only three in the book, right? There's four. There are four in the book? Okay, I only had three. It's been that kind of day. <laughs> well, we'll do all four. <laughs> remember to move this over eventually. <laughs> All right. I meant to bring a couple of blindfolds with me, but for a moment, just take and put your hands over your eyes. You need to take your glasses off to go ahead and do that. What do you hear? People 
people moving sometimes. People moving sometimes? Do you hear the hum of the lights? That was my my stupid recorder making funny noises. <laughs> I think I hear the heat. But... You probably do hear the heat. Um, do you hear anything outside of the building? Nope. 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 Cars aren't being cooperative. Okay, you can take your hands off your eyes. There is a bit of the passage today where we're going to talk about the people who are running away from Jerusalem. It's the story of the two people who are walking to Emmaus. Why we get this in this year, I don't know. This is the year we read Matthew, but we're reading Luke today. Um, when they're walking to Emmaus, they meet a man on the road, and they don't recognize him. Their eyes aren't closed. They're walking and talking with him, but they don't recognize him for all of this trip, whether it's eight miles or 20, we don't know how long, but they walk all day with this man. They don't recognize him. Um, I'm going to ask the question you ask kids when you do the children's sermon. Who do you think he is? There you go. <laughs> the kids always answer this one right because they always know the answer has to be Jesus no matter what the question is. <laughs> Well, they were not expecting to yeah. see him mm -hmm. or encounter him, so they, their mind was not functioning in that direction. Yeah, the mind, they weren't expecting to see Jesus, but they didn't recognize him the whole day, even though he was talking like Jesus always talked. They didn't recognize him. In some senses, their eyes were closed. It wasn't till he broke bread with them that they recognized him. Sometimes we get our eyes focused on too many things. I'm sure Lois can kind of relate to this. I know that when I had the really bad vertigo a couple years ago, I learned to rely on other senses because I couldn't walk straight. I couldn't walk at all some days. It was like crawling to the bathroom. So I had to learn to focus on other things which is a real problem when you love to read. And watching the, page, the words jump all over the page was a problem. I really couldn't do it. So I had to rely on other things. I learned to listen to lots of books on tape. I still have about 400 in my Kindle. Oh, I <laughs> um, so I learned to do other th things in different ways. Sometimes we get so focused on God, on expecting God to do certain things in certain ways, don't we? Sometimes it's helpful to let God do things in different ways. And to listen instead of look, to hear, to smell, to do things differently. Though so I swear if I see another step, step in another thing of cat, of, of cat puke this week, I might not want to be smelling anything. <laughs> What is it that you need to look at something in different ways this week? Slow down. I'll echo that one. What do you need to do differently this week? Be content with my circumstances as they are. <laughs> I can get that one. You especially have to do that this week, don't you? You don't have to answer out loud. Just think about it for a moment. Let us pray. Dear God, help us to look, to smell, to hear, to touch, to see your world differently this week. This week. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Today's litany is about those beliefs that we instill in ourselves, our children, and others that may tell something true or untrue about ourselves or themselves. 
Let's take a moment to reflect on the stories we have told about our whole lives and how they reflect the beauty of God's children. And then ask for God's courage to build back beauty and strength. Let us see the beauty of others in all of God's complexity and wonder as God sees each of us. Some beliefs are like walled gardens. They encourage exclusiveness and the feeling of being especially privileged. Other beliefs are expansive and lead the way into wider and deeper sympathies. Some beliefs are like shadows, clouding children's days with fears of unknown calamities. Other beliefs are like sunshine, blessing children with the warmth of happiness. Some beliefs are devices, separating the saved from the unsaved, friends from enemies. As other beliefs are violent in a world community, where severe differences unify the family. Some beliefs are like blinders, shutting off the power to choose one's own direction. As other beliefs are like gateways opening wide vistas for exploration. Some beliefs weaken a person's selfhood. They blight the growth, growth of resourcefulness. As other beliefs nurture our confidence and their feelings of personal worth. Some beliefs are rigid like the body of death, impotent in a changing world. As other beliefs are pliable like the young sapling that are growing with the upward process of life. Help us, O oh God, to plant love and life in each of your children, that they may grow into beautiful, fruitful, beloved adults that you want them to be. Amen. Peter 
1, 17 through 23. Since you call upon a father who judges all people according to their actions, without favoritism, you should conduct yourselves with reverence during the time of your dwelling in a strange land. Live in this way, knowing that you are not liberated by perishable things like silver or gold from the empty lifestyles you inherited from your ancestors. Instead, instead, you are liberated by the precious blood of Christ, like that of a flawless, spotless lamb. Christ was chosen before the creation of the world, but was only revealed at the time, at the end of time. This was done for you, who through, through Christ are faithful to the God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. So now your faith and hope should rest in God, as you set yourselves apart by your obedience to the truth, so that you might have genuine affection for your fellow believers. Love each other deeply and earnestly. Do this because you have been given new birth, not from the type of seed that decays, but from seed that doesn't. This seed is God's life-giving life -giving and enduring world. We will sing verses 1, 3, and 5 of Jesus Christ is risen today, <clears throat> hymn number 245. I'm sorry, 2.40. I'm goofing. Uh, I'm sorry, this is what happens when I'm doing things trying to read from way far away. <laughs> from the book of Luke, the 24th chapter, beginning in the 13th verse. Hear the word of God. On the same day, we're still on Easter. It's three weeks in and we're still on Easter. <laughs> on the same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking up to each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem who is, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place there over the last few days. And he replied to them, What things? They said to him, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. 
But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago. But there's more. Some women from our group left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had seen a vision of angels who told them he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found the things just as the women said, but they didn't see him. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, your dull minds are keeping you from believing all that the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then he interpreted the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going on ahead. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at the head of the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And at that moment, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the way? And he explained the scriptures for us. They got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. When they found the eleven and their companions gathered together, they were saying to each other, the Lord has indeed risen. He appeared to Simon. Then the two disciples described what was happening, what happened on the road and how Jesus had made known to them, was made known to them when he broke the bread. God bless the reading and the hearing of this God's holy word. Amen. There's a resort commercial that tells it location, its location is the only five-star luxury vacation. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not. I've not been and I'm not likely to. It's probably way too expensive. The in, Advertisement encourages you to get away. The implication is all of us live boring, humdrum lives Monday through Friday. And we're only living on the weekends when we can get away. Or on our vacations when we're not working. They seem to imply that our lives are lived in fits and starts with work shoved in between. I think that Cleopas and the other person with him, we're not sure if it's his friend or his wife, the text isn't clear, um, may have had something of that same attitude that hangs around um, certain places like that luxury resort vacation. How quickly can we get it done? When will this agony be over? When's Friday coming? Will this day ever end? Of course, their attitude was even stronger as it's motivated, motivated by grief and despair and fear all rolled into one, rather than boredom or frustration or the fact that your boss is driving you crazy. We aren't told why they're going to Emmaus, and we're not even really sure where Emmaus is. I said earlier that um, Emmaus was either 7 or 20 miles away, and part of that problem is we're not sure what measurement um, Luke is using when he tells us that it's a certain number of stadia away. And the text converts it to 7 miles, but I hate to tell you, Greek didn't use miles. Um, so we're guessing on how far that is. So it's either 7 miles, 20 miles, or 15 miles away. Um, so wherever this place is, um, it was a good day's walk away, depending on whether they were really hoofing it or not. It was at least seven miles away, but could have been as much as 20, depending on whether they were using Roman standard miles, uh, sta seven, Roman standard stadia, Greek standard stadia, or Persian. Yeah, it, this is kind of like the old routine, what's a cubit? <laughs> so that's where we're at. Our impression is that it was an easy walking distance. I will admit that I'm not walking 20 miles in the middle of a sun, an early spring heat in Jerusalem. 
particularly when you're dropping almost 4,000 feet at Chimney I'm thinking it's seven. None of the sites that have been suggested are terribly large or terribly important. It might have been the getaway place of all getaway places, in other words. They vary in distance, and they are places that people seldom visited. Um, in the first century, in later generations, about three generations later, when Constantine's mother decides to go to Jerusalem and the surrounding areas to build shrines to the various places of Jesus' life, she's given three different options. And they build shrines and, and churches at all three sites. But when we go back and do the archaeology, we know that at least two of them didn't have towns at them in the first century. The most likely site, um, the closest of them is not likely, but so the 15 mile one is our best bet. Um, so it's a bit far for that midnight dash back home before the city gates are locked. Um, it was so it was the equivalent of Mayberry. It's the kind of place you give directions to that include things like turn left at the third cow, go a mile, and turn right at the sh next sheep. So while we don't know why Cleopas and his friend or wife were leaving the city, their destination seems chiefly designed to get away from it all. And it's not a romantic destination that they have in mind. It's not a guy's only camping trip either. They're probably convinced they're getting out of town just before things get too hot to handle. They've checked out just ahead of the cops. Their leisurely pace may even be designed to keep anyone on the road from getting suspicious. People use fear and suspicion for all sorts of purposes, and I think what they're doing is trying to avoid it at this point. It's sometimes hard for people to know what they should be afraid of, but these people have a pretty good idea. After all, their teacher was just murdered three days ago. Are they in real danger or not? Were the officials planning on killing all of Jesus' followers or not? They're not entirely sure, but they're not taking a chance. Some of the disciples are sheltering in place. Some have run for the hills like Cleopas and his friend or wife. And one of them has killed himself. Certain voices in this country have claimed that Christians are being persecuted. We're not being persecuted. Let's just get that one out of the way right now. We're not in any danger of being persecuted. None of the changes laid, charges laid, are true. Being assaulted online for your faith is not an instance of persecution. Schools setting up prayer rooms for Muslims or allowing them to depart campus to go for prayer on society is not persecution. Orthodox Jews in the same districts are allowed to leave two hours early in the winter so that they can get to the synagogue. Catholics are allowed to skip school on, day, on days of holy obligation, so are Hindu students, and so are Orthodox Christians when our calendars don't match up for, for Passover, for Easter, or for Christmas. Ask Jehovah's Witnesses currently living in Ukraine and the occupied territories what persecution looks like. Their children are being stolen from them and taken to Russia. Ask Orthodox and Catholic priests who are seeing their churches burnt to the ground around them in this Easter season in occupied territories in Ukraine. And you will know what persecution looks like. Even in Russia itself, Christian minorities are again experiencing persecution as they dare to speak up against the war that is happening. They are being arrested and thrown into jail. 
clergy are being denied their privileges. Orthodox priests are being told that if they speak out, uh, they will find themselves without their pulpit. Some of them have fled to other countries only to be turned back at the border. And on the last, Catholic priests are being targeted for arrest. In the semi-autonomous region of, of Chechnya, Islamic leaders are being killed. Gay men's names are being outed from Facebook accounts in the same regions and they are being arrested and then forced to expose friends and loved ones. Jews in the same regions are being forced to flee for fear of being killed. For many people in the Ukraine, they are facing what may be, in fact, the worst starvation they have faced since the Russians did it to them in 1939, under what was called the Holden War. For Russians of many different faiths, and for Ukrainian Christians, Jews, gay men and lesbian women, and especially transgender people, the whole war has come back with a vengeance. For them, the question is, do they seek shelter? Do they flee to Poland, Moldova? Hungary, 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 Austria, or farther east, and farther west. Some have found shelter in the United Kingdom, Canada, and a few even in the United States, knowing they leave behind loved ones who do not have that option. Like the people of Jesus' first followers, they know what persecution looks like. For us, the questions are different. Do we let people convince us that we have reasons to be afraid for ourselves, or do we say no to fear? We should be saying no. Do we walk out in faith, and do we embrace these brothers and sisters who are coming to us asking for help? Or do we label everyone who is different a threat? Do we seek to create peace, or do we escalate tensions between ourselves and individuals who are different? Do we allow the rhetoric of war to drown out the call to be peacemakers? We should be doing what Jesus did and making peace between others. For, children, for Christians who have become challenged by fear, we have a message of good news. Cleopas and his friends might have been running for the hills, but Jesus wasn't ready to let them go just yet. As they head for their retreat, they are met on the road by a stranger. He asks them what they are talking about, and they gather up the last shreds of their courage to answer. This is what they say. The things about Jesus of Nazareth, because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our, pre our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. They knew who Jesus was, in other words. And now they're running away. And they even had heard the message of Easter, and still they're running away, because this is what they say next. But there's more. Some of our women left us stunned. They went to the tomb this morning, and they didn't find the, the body. They even saw a message of angels. And some of our other people have seen it too, and still we're running away. That answer took courage. We will learn later in Acts that Paul's persecution of the church was successful in part because of the intelligence gathered against the Christians. He knows where they run to and chases after them. There's nothing to tell Cleopas, that this man met on the road, isn't a spy. It was certainly possible. From somewhere, Cleopas finds the courage to admit that he had followed Jesus. 
from somewhere he finds the courage to tell the extraordinary events of the last three days. He will say later to the other disciples that his heart burns within him the whole time. Maybe it started the moment they met on the road. His heart knew what his eyes could not see. Jesus proves yet again the power of God. It's not found in the ability to smite armies or raise the dead. It is the power of love. Jesus could see these two disciples as abandoning him, running away, and yet he does not. He does what he does with Peter. He goes to him. He goes to all the disciples. He comes running after these two. Jesus will not let them know. These are his sheep, and they know his voice, even if for the moment they can't remember where they heard it before. And he's calling them back. Luke tells us that Jesus challenges them to remember what they are taught. You're foolish people. Your dumb minds keep you from believing all the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then to enter into his glory? And then he reminds them of everything they've learned from the time they were weak. The message remains the same from Genesis to Micah. We too need to remember what we've been taught. And if we haven't been taught, we need to take the whole of Scripture and hear God speaking from Genesis to Malachi, from Matthew to Revelation, the message is still the same. God has drawn near. God has called us by name. Jake's after us when we have run away, brought us back, sometimes came screaming, defended our honor and our lives, and walked with us into danger. In Jesus Christ, God has walked into the gates of death and burst them apart. God knows us very well. We are twitchy, easily frightened. But no matter how loud the voices that are taking over for God's, no matter how many scream, be afraid, be very afraid, God's persistent whisper remains the same. In the words of the psalmist, I love God who hears my request for mercy. I call out to God as long as I live, because God listens to me closely. Death ropes found me the distress of the pit, found me. I came face to face with trouble and grief, so I called on God's name. Save me, please, God. And the answer is always, I am here. I will never leave you or forsake you. I have saved you and I am saving you every minute of every day. The empty grave is God's no to all God's powers, to all the powers and voices that tell us death is inevitable and that we must fear it. The risen Christ is God's yes to all the hopes and fears and all the loves that they try to cross. If all else fails, if we cannot remember the words of scripture or the stories of hope, if darkness has grown thick around us and death seems like the end of all things, if we have listened to fear for so long that we can no longer believe in the impossible, if the voices in the media and in our own heads have drowned out the voice of God, come with Cleopas and Peter, come with Mary Magdalene, come with our Savior's mother, come with Thomas and Paul. See again the hands, the broken hands of our Savior, lifting bread to heaven, and breaking it for each of us. Take the bread of life from his hand. Take the cup poured out for the healing of the nations. Taste and see that God is good. Amen. Let us sing together hymn number 230. Come, you faithful, rise, erase the strength.
Let your light shine before all people, that they may see your good works and give glory to God in heaven. Come, bring your gifts to your God. Pat, would you mind passing? Or Rosie, one of the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's already in there.
Let us pray. Dear God, I ask that you be with us this day as we turn to you in prayer. Be a comfort to those who are in need of healing. We pray especially for Corky and Audrey. We ask that you be with Stan and Austin as they continue to recover or are about to go through surgery. We pray for Melvin that he will continue to strengthen and give um, Atlas continued health. We ask, O oh God, that you will watch over those who are struggling with the weather problems, both here and in Hayden. Continue to be with those elsewhere who are struggling with flooding due to weather events or other issues. We pray, O oh God, that you will continue to be with those who struggle to come to terms with war and its results. We pray, O oh God, that you will find a way to make peace among nations, that you will bring children who have been stolen from their homes safely home, bring those who have refused all attempts at peace to the table where they might listen and negotiate in true faith. We ask of God for those who are in pain this day to hear a moment of comfort as they mourn those who have gone to you. We pray, O oh God, for the family of Ginger, for Vicki and the death of her friends, for Jim and his family as they continue to mourn. We ask all this in your name. And for all those other prayers that we might have that we have forgotten to say aloud, with the words that you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, and that we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now to the one who is able to keep you and each of us from falling, and lift us from the dark valley of despair to the bright mountain of hope, from the midnight of desperation to the daybreak of joy. To God be power and authority forever and ever. Amen.